Yeah, I was actually saying to someone last night, I can't even remember. I can't, I can't even remember the last time. I can remember the last time, but it's so, it's so infrequent. I get, I, I do it, speak to anyone, uh, anyone other than my wife and friends that's not on Zoom. <laughs> uh, we're all this, we're all this time on now, but uh, it's sort of falling yeah. out of habit. Um, kind of evolved. I'm quite nervous about speaking to you, David. Um, you I, guess, I guess, yeah, I am. <laughs> I guess that like, uh, <laughs> When you like someone's music as much as I've enjoyed your music over the years, it, uh, I don't know. It's it's good to feel like this because you feel you feel like you sort of always did when you were just a fan. But um, it's very nice to speak to you. Yeah. Well, do you find do you find people, do, do you find uh, you know as uh, quote unquote something of an indie godhead? Do you uh, do you find that people get a little bit bashful in your presence? Uh. I suppose so. I mean, I, it, funnily enough, it's kind of the opposite with interviewers sometimes, because you know you'll have like a half an hour or you know or less sometimes, and then uh, you know uh, someone will come along and say, "Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a massive fan, and I've I've, I've been a fan since since the mid eighties," and they've got so many questions. <laughs> Go, you know, obviously, because the band's been going a long time. We've done a lot of stuff. We've worked with different people. We've done all these different projects, and you're thinking, "Yeah, we're not going to fit this in in twenty minutes," because you know it's. It's like 15 minutes has gone, and you just asked how the band started. Yeah, <laughs> you, know? yeah. you, know, you call your LPG, thinking, we've still got another 30 years to go here. And so, it, yeah, sometimes it, it's, it kind of works against you, really. But uh, it's, it's obviously great, you know, that people have, have, have been fans for so long. So, I'm not, I'm not complaining, really. I've had a thing before, you know, sometimes I remember doing a, a cover story on the Foo Fighters for a magazine, uh, who were a band that, you know, don't don't have a tremendous amount of interest in but i was a you know nirvana nut as a teenager and i i do think dave Grohl, <laughs> probably 20 minutes in was a little bit like you're going to talk about any music i've made <laughs> post post 1993 you know um do you uh I mean, what what would maybe put me at ease is that i think that as a music fan especially a fan of indie music from uh you know the 80s is in recent years uh I found myself feeling quite distant, I guess, from um, the ideologies of many people whose music I enjoyed an awful lot as a, a younger man. Can you say something? Uh, do you have any opinions? We're talking Morrissey here, yeah, by the way. <laughs> Morrissey and increasingly Billy Bragg. Billy Bragg's my new one. I can't Billy really, Bragg. I can't really get on board with with much of what Billy has to say these days. But do you have do you have any bad opinions that can maybe make me think a little bit less of you? No, I'm completely blemish free. I think that's that's the, that's the beauty of me. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. Um, so the reason we're talking is because you've got this. Uh, you've curated the twenty uh, the twenty four songs project. Um, that's you, you putting that out. Is it next month? Yeah, May isn't it? Yeah. Was that what was it like going back to kind of what what was it like? going into such a wealth of songs because you, you there's some songs that people haven't heard before even if they were following that project uh yeah i mean it's uh i mean it started life as a as, as you probably know as a series of 12 singles in one a month in the same way we did it in in, in 1992 with the hit parade and we always thought we would compile them at some point uh but the difference being that in, in 1992, they all fit nicely onto a double LP. This time, because of some kind of quite longer epic kind of tracks, it, it soon became obvious that it was going to be like five sides of vinyl. And then we thought, well, if we're going to do that, we might as well just, just do a triple album because you know, we'll have six LP, you know, six sides. And uh, so then we started looking at other tracks that have not been on albums, you know, since the last album, which was Going Going. 2016 so it's like a there's a single that came out and a few other things and so it's become this massive kind of uh compilation album really i you know it sounds a bit progressive rock but it, it is literally a, a triple lp and then we thought well you know we're throwing <laughs> cds two cds in there and a dvd and uh became it, it, as, as with the wedding present quite often actually it, it went from this little idea and it expanded and expanded and suddenly it's like this massive uh production I was totally obsessed with the um, 
we should be together soon during lockdown. It was a little ray of light during the yeah, great uh, song, right, isn't it? A, a time of uh, a, a time of darkness. Um, was I presume the the hookup with Louise when I came by a job? Yeah, of course. I mean, it was, it was uh, when I first met John, uh, with a view to him being the wedding band's guitarist going forward. He uh, he played me the demo. He said, "Yeah, you know, as a sleeper fan, you won't have heard this," and I hadn't. And it was because it was a, a song written, you know, I don't know how many years ago. It was in the nineties, obviously, uh, and, it, and it never got recorded because I, I don't think Louise liked it at the time or something. He said. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is a great song. We should, we should, you know, we should have this. Yeah. <laughs> and he yeah. said, "Yeah, fine, cover it." And uh, and I thought, well, obviously, it'd be nice if 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 Louise could be on it in some way. So we kind of reworked it into this kind of uh, duet, really. And so, uh, so it was. It wasn't so, written. Yeah, as a, it wasn't written as a duet. No. no. Right, right. And Sleeper have actually now released their version of it, I think, or a version of it, and it's just her singing it as a normal song. It's a bit different from ours, actually. Especially that first version, because that was during the pandemic when we did the lockdown and stripped back sessions. And so we did an acoustic version first, which is weird because normally you do like you know, the proper recording and then think later down, some, you know, years later, oh, we should do an acoustic version of that track or whatever. And this was the other way around. We did the acoustic version first and we just said, because it was all recorded at home, I asked John if Louise could just, you know, sing on sing at home and we'll, and we'll put it on this acoustic version which is where you first heard it i think yeah yeah yeah. and uh but it, yeah it was, it was such a such a good song and you know people people loved it really so we thought well when, when we do the 24 songs project the, the year after i suppose uh it could be the first first single really so so she re-recorded a, a version on the, on the full band the electric version how do you think that the way that you write songs has changed with John being in the band. Uh, it changes all the time with you know with different people coming and going. Really, it's one of the beauties of it. I mean, it's always it's always a bit sad when someone leaves the band because you know you've been working with them for a while, you establish this relationship, and suddenly they've gone, and it's like losing a friend or something. You know, but then somebody else comes in, and they've got all these new ideas and stuff. And, and with John in particular. You know, we're talking about a, a platinum album <laughs> selling uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. mega star, really. So you know, he's, he knows what he's doing, and uh, yeah, you know, loads of ideas for, for for songs that are you know he was bombarding me from the very beginning with these riffs, and you know, sometimes it'd be just a little kind of tune, and sometimes it'd be almost like a complete song. You know, you're waiting for the vocals, really, and uh, and then also in the studio, you know, he's obviously had a lot of experience. He's worked with big names like Stephen Street and stuff and uh loads of ideas it's like having an extra producer in the studio almost you know uh, we were working on stuff and he'd say oh we could we could do this or you know guitar part here or we could add a pedal on this you know and it, stuff I've never done before because I just never thought of it really you know so he, you know it it, it it doesn't always work but often you go that sounds great you know we've never it sounds like the wedding present but not a wedding present that I've heard before, so let let's do it kind of thing, and it's yeah, it was a it was a joy really to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that you know, as a I was a you know a bit of a Britpop kid in the nineties, and I was always a fan of Sleeper. But I, as I've got older, I, I feel like I feel like that band are quite misunderstood in lots of ways. I mean, I, when I go back and well, listen I thought to that at the time, to be honest, really? <laughs> I remember thinking at the time. Yeah, I remember thinking, you know, it was, it was your Blurs and your Oasis and stuff. And I, I remember, it sounds like I'm saying this now, I'm making it up, but I think Sleeper was my favourite band of that era. Because I always thought that they were, they were great songs and she had a great voice and, you know, I loved the, the, the interview she used to do and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, no, she was a, she was a great pop star, un, unquestionably. It's, uh, I, I find some of those records from that time now, maybe my ears have become a little bit more cultured. I struggle with some of the synths. Some of the synths, I, I oh, go. Yeah, you know, <laughs> totally I'm, with your own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely, absolutely. But uh, that song, what, that song, what should I do now? I think that's that, that might be my favourite song of that era. Actually, the, yeah, yeah, just how melancholy it is. Um, why did you? Yeah. Why did you cover my favourite magazine song? Uh, well, that was because we. Uh, funnily enough, that was actually. We did that in the live set a few years ago, oh, and it was uh, it was before before John joined. It was a completely different lineup, to be honest with you. 
and it was our drummer at the time, Charlie Layton. And I think he was a magazine fan or something, but he just, you know, we were just putting a set together for, I think it was for a European tour, actually. And he said, you know, do, do you want to do this cover? And we've always, you know, the wedding present had a history of, of, of doing covers and, and trying to, you know, work with, with different types of music and stuff. And so we, we had to go and we thought, yeah, this is, sounds really good. So uh, put it in the set. And then I forgot about it, to be honest. And then, I mean, funnily enough, when we started doing the 24 Songs series, it was uh, not to emulate the hit parade, but it was obviously the same kind of thing. And I originally thought that we would do the same thing as we did in 1992, which was an original on the A side and a cover on the B side throughout the 12 singles. And so straight away I thought, well, we've got one already arranged and ready to go with the magazine song, right. so we'll record that. And then it transpired that that, that, we, that we didn't go down that route. I mean, partly because of John bombarding me with all these ideas. And I was thinking, well, we've got enough songs here, you know, to do 24 of our own songs, you know, regardless of these covers. So... We didn't in the end in the end that was the only cover that we did apart from the uh, sleeper song so uh it kind of changed but so that was yeah that was the thinking behind it but it is it's a really good song i think i feel really bad that the two songs that i've uh, brought up so far are, aren't your compositions sorry mm. about that <laughs> <laughs> um That's all right. if, if, if it makes any if it makes any difference i i think that song the loneliest time of the year is uh, one of my favorite wedding present songs ever i think yeah, that's thank you. It's a yeah, it's See, a nice one, isn't it? It's a nice back, one of, to end back, yeah. back of the side now. I I really I really <laughs> like I really like it when uh, I remember I remember going to see you play. I remember going to see the wedding present play at Newcastle Students Union um, when when it, it, Interstate Nine came out, and I remember hearing that song. I don't five. Know, five, sorry, I, I never. Uh, no, it's, it's that other song you wrote. About the the other interstate, I that's the next project. Twenty four interstates. Uh, I remember hearing that song, and I hadn't heard the song before you played it. And I remember thinking, "Oh God, what's going on here? This isn't the this isn't what this isn't the wedding present I know." And I like it no. when you I like it when you stretch songs out. It's something that I never would have thought when I was like you know. Dancing, crashing around yeah. my bedroom walls to brass neck or whatever. It's uh... well, I do as well, and I think you know there's there's certainly a hardcore of fans who appreciate it, but then a lot of people don't like it, you know, because because they want to hear brass neck again and they want to hear a certain, you know, especially because we, I suppose, came to fruition, I suppose, or fame or whatever the word is with with that sound, you know, the George Best, the fast guitars, the the, the jangly stuff, and then you know. After Bizarro, we did Sea Monsters, which straight away was, was like a different group, <laughs> you yeah. know, with that darker set, the rock sound and all that. And that album, I mean, weirdly now it's seen as one of our, you know, best LPs, but at the time it sold half as much as Bizarro. Right. And people say, no, you know what? It's like, I hate that. You know, where's the wedding was going? And and we've had that all, all through the last 35 years, to be honest with you. You know, uh, we've always tried to go somewhere different and, you know, we've, lost fans <laughs> but then acquired some some people who you know maybe hated the george best sound but then liked the a different you know a different yeah, texture yeah. or whatever how, Just, how, you know, how much of the 20 24... sorry, I... sorry go on david I was, <laughs> I was just gonna say i never wanted to be one of those bands you know certain bands just make the same record over and over again you know yeah, you I mean, think you definitely can't be accused of that no uh, you've heard Did it you... once haven't you when yeah exactly when when um how much of the twenty four songs project was to do with I I read something you I I read something you said in an interview recently where you were talking about the seven inch single format being like the the perfect medium for pop music and and I I, I don't really feel like that gets said enough in twenty twenty three was that was that part of did that shape how that project uh, was delivered. Not really. I, I think you know it shapes how how the hit parade was delivered. Uh, right, right. Thirty years, thirty years, thirty two years ago now, whatever. Uh, because I think at that time, it it, it still meant something. I think a seven inch single in nineteen ninety two. There were still record shops where you, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you went to. Uh, so that informed that series, and then 
the hit parade in form this series really so that it was almost like uh because i was trying because it was 2021 and, and we had the you know the, the 30th anniversary of the hit parade on the horizon kind of thing and i was thinking you know should we mark it in some way and how would i do that you know would it be a hit parade type you know version two or you know what you know what should we do a series of gigs or, and i just thought you know what let's just do it again let's just do another series of seven new singles because it because it is it is a great thing to be involved with, you know, having this thing come out every month. It's like a magazine almost. And and it gives you this kind of blank canvas to experiment with, you know, the way it's going to look and how it's all going to match and build into this collection collection and uh and it, it it changes through the year as well, which is interesting. You know, when you do like an album, you just you know record, you know, you've got all these songs, you've got maybe, you know, twenty songs and you go in and record it. And they've all been written and arranged and recorded around the same time. So it's, they have a certain kind of feel to it. But then this isn't, you know, this is like, it was an ongoing project. And so we, I think we did like five recording sessions for 24 songs and we did four for the hit parade. And each time it, it moves on a bit and changes, you know. We even had a lineup change halfway through this one. So it's it's interesting how it evolves, really. Yeah, I think that's what I was kind of getting at when I was talking about you curating them for this release. Because yeah, you know, you were it. It was almost in situ, wasn't it, when you were in the midst of releasing the uh, releasing the, the the two songs every month. You, you didn't go into it with twenty four songs, I, uh, I believe. No, no, I uh, can't remember how many we had when when it started. I mean, we uh, we had a bit more preparation than because in nineteen ninety two we were literally in the studio w- one month. And then and they come out a few weeks later, yeah. but I don't know if you're aware, but you know the, the turnaround time of vinyl now is is anything up to like six or seven months. So yeah, yeah. so we did have a few, you know, kind of written and arranged and, and recorded, ready to go, and we so that was probably the summer of of 2021, and then we went in every every few weeks after that. Really, uh, sorry, I forgot what the question was. Well, no, I was just thinking that who was it. That- who was it that was in the news the other day? That what what band was it that bought a pressing plant? Was it you two or was it was it you two? Or was it Metallica? Really? Oh yeah, I very good remember this something like that. Yeah, because yeah. I was I was I, thinking I, I was thinking really? we should we should all chip in and you should we should all chip in and you should get your own uh, pressing plant. You know, it's funny, isn't it? How it's all back now, and I I can totally see why all those pressing plants closed down in the eighties and nineties because they thought you know it's all over. Yeah. It's just it's just CDs and then it's streaming. And then suddenly uh, everyone wants vinyl again, really. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I wonder. No, I, 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 I slightly wonder whether it's uh, overestimated, though. Like, you know, it's like when you know within the world of music journalism, there's a thought piece every year that's written by someone about how vinyl's back, and you know, the first yeah. thing the first thing I always think is, well, you know, for some of us it never went away, but also, uh, also is when it really back in any. Yeah. Well, when you look at the vinyl charts, it's always like it just feels like there are people. I don't know who these people are, but it just feels like people are still buying Dark Side of the Moon, or they're still mm. buying like you know the first two Oasis albums or whatever. That's always what that's what the vinyl chart is made up of. But I, that's why I think I was ex- I still get excited about seven inch singles. I just think that there just needs to be uh, there just needs there just needs to be a. Uh, uh, like an industry an industry that's reborn that allows people to it, there's nothing wrong with the medium i think it's the the distribution of the medium if that makes sense well probably because there's no record shops in which to distribute it anymore is there so you know all of our i mean that's you know, one of the differences between this and 30 years ago is in the hit parade every record was sold <laughs> via a record shop yeah this time most of them were sold by our own mail order service you know yeah, uh, yeah. online because that was the way you know it, it's the easiest way to do it really and uh and there wasn't you know the, the same number of record shops around i mean we still it's funny because when we were thinking how many should we press because of the hip rate we did fifteen thousand of each seven inch and we thought well it's definitely not like that anymore because a lot of people just want to listen to it on spotify and stuff these days so we did so we initially started we'll, we'll do a thousand of each and and we and we sold out, you know, because we had a subscription where you could pay for the whole year, and that sold out very quickly. So in the end, we did. 
Probably enough, it worked out quite well because we did 2,400. You know, okay. Uh, how, 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 many are under, it, so. how many are under your bed? Uh, under my bed, personally, none because I like it's a feng shui thing. You've got you're supposed to have space under your bed. Uh-huh. You know, these people who okay. put stuff under their bed, that's apparently bad. So, right, so I'm okay. told about right, right. there's none under my bed. Well, yeah, it's not sold out, but uh, it's definitely you know, not not done uh, badly. Uh, I don't know. If I'm honest, I don't know the exact figures because it's... Because uh, normally I do these things on my own label, Scopus Owns, but because this was such a big project uh, and we've been working with another record label called Clue Records from Leeds, actually, funnily enough, and uh, I just asked the Tony, the, the the owner of that, you know, if he fancied doing this because, it, 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 you know, logistically, it's a bit of a big one, especially with all the mail order and the subscriptions and all that. So... so so he he's uh, he's the man to ask for how many he's got left under his bed. How did you come to uh, record with Peter again? I did Peter for the I, I did a Ukrainians episode of the, the podcast about a year ago yeah. now. How did you oh, yeah. had you had you always been in contact or? Yeah, I'm in contact with all of them really because I do get uh, you know payments through from various sources for, different, for the old records and the old songs, which then I, I redistribute to them also. I mean, yeah, I'm interested. And he's actually played at my festival uh, at the Edge of the Sea in Brighton, which is an annual thing. And he's, he's played there twice now as you know, in the Ukrainians, which was, as you know, the band that he went on to form. And they just approached me and said they're doing this uh, benefit album for Ukrainian refugees in the United Kingdom. And would be uh, would we be prepared to cover a Ukrainian song in the wedding present style to go on there? And uh, I said, yeah, of course. So so we did that as part of the twenty four songs recording sessions. And Peter, I think he was at WOMAD Festival, so he was down south, which is where I live in Brighton now. And so he said, yeah, I'll, I'll come in the studio. And and so he stood in for John really on that track. So we thought it's quite nice, full circle thing really. And uh, now when I came to compiling the twenty four songs album i realized it wasn't going to go on this double lp it was going to be a, this this triple lp and so i was looking for extra tracks and i just said you know do you mind if we if we put this one on here as well and it'll hopefully promote you the benefit album when it comes out and, he, and they said yeah fine so it's a nice way to end end the the compilation of 24 songs as well yeah yeah no totally um i didn't i i, I think i did know but i totally forgotten you you're in brighton because obviously john's in brighton Is john in brighton yeah um, yeah, in fact, the whole band lives, lives like five minutes walk, and it's weird because that's how we started in Leeds, in Leeds yeah. Six, uh, the the university area. We always live five minutes away from each other, and then for various reasons, we scattered all around the world at various points. People lived in Germany and America and stuff, and now now we're back to this, <laughs> literally five minutes away from each other again. So it's uh, again full circle. That's the theme of this interview. It really is, yeah. I, it, it... If I timed it better, I would have asked that in about four minutes' time. But uh, <laughs> we're not we're, we're not perfect. Um, do you ever um, do you ever roll a decks of ex members? Is, is anyone ever has anyone just disappeared from view and you've got no idea what ever happened to them? Uh, <clears throat> well, there's a there's a few that weren't kind of full members who therefore don't get royalties and things, and I've not really been in contact with some of them, but. Uh, Funnily enough, I mean, one of the things about John is because he's in Sleeper as well. There are occasions where you know we'll we'll get off at a festival. You know, we'd actually just been offered some stuff in uh, the Primavera Sound Festival and uh, something in Prague, and he can't do it because he's he's doing stuff with Sleeper. Right. So then I, I get that Rolodex out and I look at the ex members and you know, say, like, oh, do you fancy coming back? And it's you know a lot of them you know have, have got all the stuff now, so they can't do it, but. But some of them, you know, do come back in occasionally, and, uh, and they already know the song, so it's it's easy for them to kind of assume their role. Uh, so, I mean, uh, like the indie yeah, Aven- like the indie uh, Avengers, always having someone on, uh, always having someone who can... very similar, very similar. I don't know what that sound was. It was supposed to be a sort of superhero kind of sound. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, this this might be a bit niche, but um, play. Um, Two years time, you can you can find somewhere to play. Take take fountain in full, surely. We do that for me. We have, we just played take fountain in full. 
uh, for out the edge of my festival. Yeah, you should come to my festival. It's great. When's, when's, the, when's the next one? Well, August. It's every. It's the middle of every August, basically. Obviously, we, we stopped with the pandemic, but uh, it's the 13th one this year. And I can't remember what we're doing this year, but I think, it, was it last year we did... Uh, Oh, I think this year we're going to do a 24 songs themed set. But last year we, because the wedding doesn't play two nights. So we do a normal set on the Friday night and then on the Saturday night, which is, it's like an all day thing on Saturday. Cinerama, my other band play. And then the wedding present. And it's often a theme. So I think it was last year we did Take Fountain. It might have been the year before. No, last year we did Take Fountain in its entirety. So uh, it was a one off kind of thing. Well, but maybe, uh, maybe, I do maybe, get that album. Maybe a two-off, maybe do it again at some point. It's always worth thinking about, yeah. Yeah, give it. Let time. me make a note. Scribble, scribble, scribble. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll we'll end it with this. I used to work in a music venue. Um, I got. To, oh, I used to work at Northumbria University before I went off and oh, okay. wrote, before I went off and wrote about music. I worked there for a few years. Have we when played I, there. It, it feels like a familiar name to me. Well, this is it, you see. So um, I oh. <laughs> heard, I heard that when you played, there was a period of time where you would ask for dogs on the rider. Yes, I'm pleased to hear that's true. What's the what's the best? Well. <laughs> what's the best? What's the best? I mean, I should clarify for the benefit of people listening and watching that uh, you know you, you gave them back. But what's the best? Mm. What's the best dog that you ever got? Oh, loads. I mean, it was it's funny because there was a promoter who did an interview recently and he, and he said, what's, he was asked, what's the weirdest thing you've ever been asked for on a rider? And he said the wedding present with the asking for a dog. And uh, it's because we always, you know, dogs cheer everybody up. So yeah, you're on tour, you're tired, you know, you're bored, you, you get to a venue, it's freezing, it's, you know, whatever. And uh, if there's a dog there, everyone's, oh, look at this. And everyone's, having a great time with the dog but we didn't you know what it was basically it was if the venue could could provide a dog to be in the venue between our loading time and doors it would be appreciated really it wasn't a deal breaker you know if it, there's no dog we're not going on it, it wasn't like that yeah no but snow, it was no just show. a nice thing. but uh, i remember one of them actually we put in the dressing room and uh i came back in once and our bass player and uh my girlfriend at the time were just rolling around on the couch, laughing, laughing their heads off. I'm like, what, what's we like? I said, look at that. And this dog was had its head on the table, eating all the food off the rider. That you know the sandwiches and the you know, yeah. and it was just so hilarious. So like oh, that's 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 bit is on the bottom that that one because not only is it on the rider, it's actually eating the rider as well. So nice. that was a that was a funny one. Amazing. It's in my uh, autobiography that story actually. Yeah. I remember it because I do an autobiography. It's like a comic. I don't know if you've seen it. It's, no, uh, I haven't. No. It's called Tales. From, it's called Tales from the Wedding Prison. It was a comic initially, and now it's it's well, it's two graphic novels because Volume One came out in 2020, and then Volume Two came out last year. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, but it, how is, it's how just is basically my. Me? How has that passed me by? I'm a fan of comics. I'm a fan of the Wedding Prison. I don't know how that's happening. Well, yeah, when they got on a mailing list, mate. <laughs> it's on the website. I, don't think so. I think the thing is, though... Oh, is... I'm a massive fan of comics. I love doing it, to be honest. It's great. What's your favourite uh, What's your favorite run of comics? Well, where do I begin? You know, are you talking alternative? Are you talking Marvel? Or... Tell me something... Um... <laughs> it's funny, I'm just writing a piece at the moment about... Marvel's decision about about the uh, the issue of Spider Man that came out just after nine eleven, where it's got uh, Doctor Doom and um, Kingpin and all the all the villains sort of and Magneto kind of helping lift the twin the the twin the debris of the twin towers and what a strange thing that is when you look at it twenty years on. But uh, give me okay, some well, give me something uh, that's like alternative that I might like that I might not have heard about. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with the work of uh, Joe Matt? No. Oh, he's great, actually. I'm actually in Los Angeles as as we speak, and uh, he lives here, so we should I should try and look him up because I've not seen him for a few years. But yeah, J O E M A T T. 
he, he does these kind of again kind of autobiographical comics uh he's very he's very slow at producing them so so there aren't loads but he's, right. he's worth checking out oh, you know chester do. brown oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of in that in that, that kind of realm but uh yeah, it's funny whenever when you know I, I draw a bit myself. I I'm like a fanzine kid from sort of back in the day, and kind of sporadically make little sort of small press runs of comics. And sometimes when I've been to like um, comic cons to sell them, you know, like on the sort of the trestle table kind of bits of yeah. comic cons. Oh, well, I know it very well. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes people will say, "Oh, you know, what kind of comics are are you into?" And I'm like, "Well." You know, if it's anything about, you know, mental illness or, you know, people dying of a horrible disease or um, <laughs> just, just anything that's kind of personal and grim. And obviously kind of Chester Brown's a little bit of a kind of a kingpin of that kind of scene and stuff. So Yeah. 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 Right. Well, well listen. So, uh, Tales from the Wedding Present is a bit more lighthearted, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, I will investigate, though. I'll get on that mailing list. And if you, uh, yeah, if you play, um, well, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I will put your festival in my diary and I will uh, I will make it along. And if, you know, if you can do Interstate 5 or 9 or 7 or 21 or any number of Interstate, then uh, that would be much appreciated. I'll bear it in mind. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, David. I'll speak to you again. Pleasure. See okay. you, man. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs>